Ah, hello there, dear tourists. While I appreciate the attention, let's be honest. Standing in line for hours just to see me is not exactly the most exciting way to spend your holiday. Trust me, I've been hanging here for centuries and I've seen it all. The pushing, the shoving, it's not pretty. As Vincent van Gogh, I might say, don't just go to see my paintings, go to Denmark. There, you can skip the crowds and enjoy the simple pleasures of life. Like biking through charming towns. Exploring picturesque coastlines. And let's not forget about Denmark's legendary food scene. Wow! That's the true joy of travel. The unexpected surprises and adventures that come from stepping off the beaten path. That being said, I do hope to see you back soon. I do get lonely in this museum, you know. It's a great ad, and uh, it was entirely scripted by ChatGPT, which is going to freak out a lot of ad agencies. And um, it was, you know, it was trimmed a little bit for edited for sort of length and clarity in a few places. But effectively, you know, what they've done is they've briefed it. We've got a, a large language model creating content like this. Affectiva is a company that measures engagement with apps like that. They use a webcam to understand how people's face. They measured it, and it performed at least as well, in fact, a lot better than a lot of ads that are generated by humans in ad agencies. So don't worry too much about the detail, but effectively, people smiled a lot more, and they engaged a lot more in that than is the benchmark for you know, most ads that are created. So question that we've got to ask is, if AI can create ads, you know, can it also run research projects? So, what does it mean for our industry if we're uh, you know, worried for our poor advertising colleagues? Um, you know, the, the truth is AI has been search for quite some time now. And uh, you know, before long, we're just going to stop using the AI term because it's losing a lot of meaning. But we've been doing things like text analytics, social listening. These are using language. Uh, think either in you know, surveys or, or the public sphere, using it to analyze images that people might be posting in Instagram, analyzing you know, the emotional analytics that we just talked about, like Affectiva there. Lots of different ways in which AI is being used for research. These new tools, these generative AI tools, uh, who's not played around with ChatGPT? Have we got any, any holders? Right, okay, fair enough. Um, anyway, so you'll all recognize what this is. You know, it's, it's taken the world by storm. By some measure, it's the most kind of, you know, quickly adopted consumer product in history, hundreds of millions of users already. But generating language has all sorts of applications in research, as does these, you know, image generators like, like Midjourney, like Dal E. You can create images, you can create audio now, you can synthesize audio to create, you know, fresh voices, you can clone other people's voices for nefarious reasons, but you can also use um, AI to generate avatars of people speaking. So there are lots of ways in which this generative AI stuff is being rolled out and will be adopted in research. And I want to talk about four specific applications that I think are likely to have an impact on our industry going forward. So research design, the way that we actually you know, plan and set up projects and scope them, the way we collect Data, so interviews, surveys, discussions. The way that we create data, this is something that's potentially new and a little bit disruptive, and analysis and reporting at the back end of projects. These are not exhaustive. These are just kind of four buckets, really, to illustrate um, you know, how these new tools might change things. So we look at research design to start with. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, question pros take on this. There are, there are a lot of other companies that are starting to use these language models to create um, you know, tools you can use to, if you don't really know what to design as a survey, you can enter it in an open text box, you'll get 
a structured survey back as an outline as a starting position. So, you know, you don't need to be an expert to say, I need to write a survey to measure the interest in a concept. I need to understand all the questions. If you just type in an open text box, it'll give you a draft outline of a survey. Um, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on in this space. Question Pro is, um, you know, one of the leaders there. Qualzy is a, a qualitative research platform that people use for online discussions. So, not surveys, but um, you know, online communities and that type of thing. This box here, and we'll see a lot more of these in these online survey, on, online research tools, is a interactive conversational box where you say, "Look, I want to design a project. Can you give me some help? Tell me what questions to ask." Uh, right. <laughs> um, you can also use these generative tools to do things like create concepts. So, you know, this was just something that I mocked up in uh, a tool that I use called Notion. I use it for all sorts of things. And said, you know, write me half a dozen concepts for male skin care. This is a theme we're going to come back to. Um, and I used an image generator, Stable Diffusion, to create these images. I mean, they're not great, but it took less than five minutes to create concepts that you could theoretically go and test in research, in focus groups, and so on. So, the, you know, the whole design end of research, there's lots of ways in which we can use these tools now. You can see how they're going to get better and smarter. One way that you know, we'll see a lot of refinement is in very specific applications for things like B2B or niche categories, because at the moment they're quite generic. You do need to do quite a lot of work to make them specific. Next up is data collection. And this is a trade-off that has always existed in research. You can either choose to reach a lot of people, you can do a survey, you can go big, or you can get deep by interviewing people in focus groups in face-to-face -face depth interviews. So, you know, there's a trade-off here. Things like NPS feedback, you get asked constantly, how was that experience for you everywhere? It's high reach, thousands of bits of data, not very engaging or empathetic. The other end of things is, you know, in-depth interviews, there's a kind of strong psychological component to those and a lot of empathy there. AI is starting to show how you can bring some of these things together. And it's, you know, it, it, it's easy to uh, critique this and say that you can't get empathy at scale. It doesn't exist. That's not really what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there are ways in which this is starting to bridge that gap. So, you know, if we think we move it up one notch at a time, video feedback is something that has actually been embedded in surveys for, for some time now. You've been able to put in a video question. AI on the back end will analyze what people say. It will identify the sentiment and so on and transcribe it for you. So video feedback, a little bit more than just a kind of straight survey response. There are new tools. So I mentioned about the generative AI for video. So this is a startup called Fortel which is being piloted actually in, uh, in some countries in Africa for NGO feedback. And it uses an avatar to ask questions in a native language and then records the answers that people give. So you can see this is, you could scale this to thousands of bits of feedback with it feeling a little bit more empathetic. Then you've got what are called conversational surveys. So this is using AI, the language models, to rather than just asking, fill in this box and tell us what you think, the AI will respond to what's, what you've said and say, uh, you know, can you tell us a bit more about that? Oh, that's very interesting, Mike. Thank you very much. So you get a bit, bit more of a, an interactive experience in the, the survey taking experience. And then there's... Uh, you know, if we scroll forward a little bit, we can see a world quite soon where we might have robot moderators for qualitative discussions. And this is, again, there's a lot of stuff that unsettles people in this, and you can understand why. Has anybody seen this? Yeah? Do we know this? Yeah, there's, all t there's competing visions for like the future of, of, of AI. You know, you've got the kind of Terminator thing, we're all going to die. I like this one because it's actually, you know, it's got a lot of emotional texture, this film. It's fantastic. It's called Her. And Joaquin Felix falls in love with his, what is effectively an AI. They didn't call it an AI at the time. Anyway, there are lots of tools now where people are starting to build emotional relationships, like replica, like uh, conversation agents. People are building quite deep relationships with these AI models. Um, that's not what I'm going to show you. Uh, but um, I, I briefed ChatGPT to interview me as if it were a qualitative researcher and said, look, ask me some questions about my skincare habits. Respond to each one that I, you know, I give you back and then, you know, dig deeper and, you know, ask me what I might think about a new product based on what I've told you. So you can see this is the kind of fairly static response. Don't read it. It's boring in ChatGPT. But what I did, I took that 
uh, and used another couple of AI tools, actually, to um, put a synthetic voice on top of that conversation and then slightly, uh, you know, with a little bit of artifice, inserted myself into this interview. So this is, you can watch, you can watch the full thing online. I'm not going to torture you with it all, but... Um, to begin, can you please tell me a bit about yourself, such as your age, occupation, and any hobbies or interests that you have? I'm 50 years old, uh, I run my own business, and I'm a fellow of yoga running and swimming. It's great to hear that you're active and have your own business. <laughs> Considering your lifestyle and the fact that you engage in outdoor activities like running and swimming, how important is skincare to you? And what specific concerns do you have when it comes to taking care of your skin? Yeah, I worry that it gets quite dry. Um, you know, when I go running, I sweat quite a lot, it's quite salty. When I go swimming, when the cool room in the pool dries out my skin. Um, I guess I'm also a bit worried about sun damage in the, you know, in the sun. Thank you for sharing your concerns. It seems like hydration and sun protection are important factors for you. Can you please tell me which skincare products you currently use to address these concerns? and how effective you find them in dealing with dryness, salt from sweat and sun damage. Okay, all right, too much information. But anyway, the, uh, you know, the, the point there is that these models, with a fairly basic prompt, you know, it was just interview me, include these topics, was able to respond to what I was saying, was feeding back, was kind of riffing off the feedback that I was giving. The longer, the longer version's about five minutes, you can see a bit more. You know, at the moment, it's still fairly basic. It's not at the level of empathy you'd get from a human interviewer, but you can see how it will build over time to get a bit better. So you bring these things together, that avatar-based interviewing, the kind of real-time anal you know, analysis and understanding, and then the response back. You can see how you can get to somewhere that's a little bit more like, you know, large-scale qualitative research. Sorry, okay. Um, right, this one is unsettling for a lot of people because it involves the, uh, the generation of what I guess you might call synthetic humans. Now, this, is, this has been around for a while in the use of virtual eye tracking. So eye tracking, you know, a lot of work with, uh, with glasses in store, understand where people look, tracks pixel uh, pupil movements. A lot of work now done with webcams, and then, you know, you get a composite picture of where people are looking with these heat maps. It's great for kind of design stuff. Now, taking all of, you know, a lot of previous eye tracking studies, you can build predictive models to go, okay, we know from all our previous eye tracking work, people usually look at the red button. They usually look in the top right, all of these types of things, more sophisticated than that. Tools like Dragonfly AI. If you upload a pack design or a website design into this product, it will give you a simulated heat map of where the human attention is going to be drawn. It's not perfect, but it gives you a good guideline compared to, uh, you know, the, the time and cost involved in going and doing primary research with people. This is quite well established in web design. A lot of tools actually have this built in. Taking that a step further, this is a company called AIMPOWER that uses a neuroscience model and some of those similar techniques to build predictive models for what's going to work for marketing assets. Digital ads, packaging designs, various things. These guys are working with Henkel. There's something like 800 of the Henkel marketing team. Designers, you know, brand managers are using this tool to optimize point of sale materials, pack designs, and various things. And you can see an example here, you know, the kind of pre and post. You upload your design, it says, oh, this is rubbish, your language is wrong, your, you know, your image is not standing out. And then, you know, you go back, you refine it, you upload it again, and it gives you a green score. And it says, oh, this is much better. This is more likely to be understood and easy to stand out at, at point of sale. So there's lots of tools like this that are actually in the market now. The thing that people are getting quite anxious about is this whole synthetic respondence. Imagine now we've got, you know, a survey of 1,000 people. We like to think that most of them are humans when they're answering. Not always true. But, um, you know, the, the people who are responding to surveys are giving us answers. But actually, a lot of surveys ask stuff that's already been asked. There's a lot of knowledge in these new language models that we can actually build, you know, predictive uh, models on top of. Companies like uh, Synthetic Users, there's one called Native, uh, gonative.ai, if you want to check it out, are building effectively digital twins of humans. 
to be able to ask questions to. So rather than going straight to a real genuine audience of people, you can ask your question to the synthetic audience and you'll get some kind of feedback. Now, again, it's never going to be as you know, comprehensive or uh, as exhaustive as real feedback, but it will play a role in the process of people trying to refine their, their thinking. And then the back end of projects, so analysis and reporting. Um, this is uh, just sticking with the skincare theme for some reason. Um, this is uh, a whole lot of made up responses to an open ended survey question. And so Notion is a tool that I use for a lot anyway in my business. It's a, it's a kind of productivity tool. It's got AI built in, it links to GPT. You'll have seen some of this, I'm sure, which is summarize the data. So this summarization feature is fantastically valuable. You can upload long form transcripts of qualitative interviews. You can get it to, you know, to summarize what people have talked about in you know, surveys of thousands, tens of thousands of people to analyze the open-ended responses. There's a lot of power in this. There's also some risk that you miss some of the interesting outlier things, but you know you can see how it can really accelerate. And I think we'll see a lot more of these type of um, conversational interfaces for analytics, for you know for numbers. So this is an example which is more generic, not just for research, but for uh, interacting with you know data sets, with Excel sheets, and so on. And you know the Question Pro guys are rolling this out with their, their kind of automated insight copilot for analyzing survey data. So if you're not an experienced researcher, you can use a tool like this to go. Can you just tell me which group of people said the most interesting thing, or what should we do? You know, where's the where are the interesting insights in this data? And it'll generate you know report. It'll uh, hold your hand to the right place. Going beyond that, this is a, a little startup called SurveyMind, which has, uh, again, a, a survey tool on the front end. But then when you've got the data, it will actually write you a report fully autonomously. So it will use the language model to write the report. It will put in the charts to illustrate the points it's trying to make um, you know, at different points. So lots of ways in which the research project process is going to be disrupted here. Um, and finally, this is the sort of knowledge management at the back end and actually you know across many projects a lot of in-house uh, consumer insights research teams use uh, actually market logic is a is a kind of knowledge management provider for research and insights their new product deep sites is a bit like a chat gpt for your own data and you know for a lot of organizations it needs to be secure ring fence proprietary so you put something like this in and it'll it'll tell you answers to your questions you know tell us what you know what if you're a marketer you want to say what insights do we have on people's adoption of this product in this segment in this market and it'll show you it'll give you a little summary and it'll tell you where to find more information so it's kind of like it is like a chat gpt for your own data but with referencing and sourcing as well so you can find out where it comes from so Analysis, you know, qualitative, quant, ongoing kind of meta-analysis across projects. These language models are gonna are gonna have quite a big role. Okay, so just looking broadly, what does this mean? You know, there are a lot of challenges in here. This is kind of disruptive to the way that the research industry has been working for some time. And in the short term, you know, the stuff that I've shown you is like, isn't this wonderful, isn't it cool? You need to be aware there's a lot of risks in it because chat GPT especially, don't upload any proprietary data if you're a brand, don't upload any client data if you're an agency. It, you know, the, you need to be very, very careful about where your data is going, how it's being analyzed, and uh, if it's been fed back in to retrain somebody's model. They also get a lot of stuff wrong. You know, they talk about hallucination, and you know, there's a lot of inaccuracy. It just makes up stuff. I mean, you've probably seen the the story about the lawyer, um, where he was actually, you know, presenting made-up precedent cases that because he'd fed it all into ChatGPT, and you know, he basically, you know, almost got struck down for it in the in the US. So he's had to he's had to write, you know, signed uh, affidavit. He'll never use ChatGPT in the law in the courtroom again. So, um, but it just makes stuff up. It's not optimized for truth it's optimized for creativity which uh, you know is a bit of a challenge and it's just not that transparent uh, you know the the way in which the models are built the sources the training data all of this is kind of commercial proprietary stuff for the for the model builders so you need to be very careful about how these things work you know we need more transparency generally in society for this stuff um, in the medium term, I think you know the the research world is going to adapt to this AI powered industry what does it mean? For 
people who hire researchers and work with them, it's like, well, what roles do we do? What, you know, what kind of people do we hire and how do we train them? And then there's going to be a whole load of new players in this space, maybe tech startups. If you're a client and you're buying things, there's going to be a lot of noise out there with, with companies you know, selling, some of which will be snake oil, some of which is going to be interesting stuff. If you're an agency, you're going to have a lot of new types of competitors. And you know, the role of in-house research and insights teams is going to be challenged as well because there are going to be people in other departments, you know, marketers, brand teams that go, I don't really need to, I can do this myself, this stuff is so easy, it's a conversational tool, I'll just make it up with ChatGPT. You know, there's all sorts of, uh, of risks there for in-house teams. But lots of opportunities as well. I would say in the short term, if all of this stuff is a bit, um, you know, rabbit in the headlights, just, you know, Play around with some of this stuff. Learn about what's out there. There's a lot of good resources. And, you know, talk to clients about their needs, about their anxieties. If you're an agency, you know, you can potentially bring some of these cool tools and say, hey, look, you know, here's a way in which we can, you know, we can help shortcut the process. There's a lot of innovation going on. I know Sim's going to talk about some of this in a bit. Um, you know, then I think it's... It's going to be about efficiency in the short term. How do we get stuff done quicker for less cost? This is where the focus will be. It's going to be about taking cost and time out of existing processes. If you're an agency, if you're a client, you can get a template, you know, a draft of your brief written very, very quickly, uh, and then you can refine it. You know, if you're analyzing open-ended data from surveys, you know, automated coding, that type of thing, summarizing qualitative research, you know, lots of uh, lots of applications there. Um, and then I think beyond that, we're looking at how do we actually build some new value propositions, some interesting creative stuff, not just about being efficient, but you know, build new, uh, new stuff. So how do we combine AI with, you know, with kind of human consultancy stuff? How do we merge synthetic and real primary data? Uh, you know, how do we build these types of applications that are better in these niche categories, you know, the things that, uh, like, you know, offshore wind turbines, you know, there's, there's a lot of this stuff is great for generic consumer markets, but when you get into the detail of other sectors, it's not so straightforward. And, you know, even things like reports are a pretty static thing. Here's your PowerPoint, here's your output. We're going to be able to generate outputs from research that are conversational. People can then go and query, they can go and ask questions of them after you've left the room. So there's a lot of upside, I think, for research users and, uh, and providers in all of this stuff. So, you know, the question at the start was, you know, it, is it friend or foe, this generative AI stuff? Um, you know, the answer is yes, I think. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's what I've got. Is that all right? I told you I could do it 25 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry. There are some more resources. So this is um, the. There's a whole load of uh, free videos, webinars, uh, stuff on on Insight platforms, which is the site that I run. And in about a month, we're going to host this event. It's a virtual event, and it's free to attend. And Question Pro will be demoing some of their generative AI toolkit there, alongside a whole load of other different types of providers, tech providers, with um, you know, with a kind of focus on. Uh, tech-led and innovation for, for research. So that's free to sign up. You can uh, you can head there anytime. Okay.